Welcome back to the Fantasy Hockey Podcast, Unsustainable Wednesdays, like we all know, the favorite episode of the week of the one where you know whether someone's a bum or is going to keep doing the silly things they're doing. So we're going to get started here and jump right into this week's Unsustainably High, and Brandon has a special PSA for you on the first player of Unsustainably High. Hey guys, are you looking for a player that plays 13 minutes a game? doesn't play on top power play, gives you no peripherals, and plays with two guys you probably have never heard of? Well, you're in luck. For you, I've got Nick Schmaltz, center left wing 31%, playing with Christian Dvorak and Connor Garland. I'm sure some of you actually know who those two players are, but a lot of people don't. And the reason is because they've never mattered in fantasy more than maybe one or two weeks in a row. We've got Schmaltz here playing on second power play with a bunch of people you also don't know, like Jacob Chikrin, who I like, but I shouldn't. And uh, Goligoski, maybe? Who even knows? But certainly not on top power play with guys like Phil Kessel and Clayton Keller, who you might actually want to play with. Nick Schmaltz is one of the fastest rising ads in the last few weeks, and that's because he's been getting points. But he's been getting points very unsustainably because he's playing with a couple of bums and not any ice time. So... That's the first call. Nick Schmaltz, unsustainably high. Be careful. And if you pick up a Schmaltz today, get a second one for free. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I honestly don't know how to follow that up because it was just too good and way too accurate. But I've got someone probably as unsustainable as Nick Schmaltz, and that is Ryan Ellis, a defenseman who's currently on a 113 point pace. But if you look at only last week, he's on a 164 point pace. Totally sustainable for a defenseman, of course, if your name is Bobby Orr. Now, he got 55% of his points in this last week, so that's why you're seeing him kind of get ridiculous. I think he's on a three-game, two-point streak or something like that. His shooting is up on the season, which is good, and his shooting percentage is actually in line, but that's about where all the sustainability stops. His on-ice shooting percentage is 15.79%, way too high, and his IPP is 61.1%. Now, if you look at the past week, he actually was involved on every single goal that was scored on the ice while he was. His power play percentage is actually down from last year, a tad, like uh, we're talking 3%, so not big, but it's still something. You'd like that to continue to go up if he's doing well, right? And his secondary assist rate is low, but that indicates more than anything to me that the factor that's helping him out is that high on ice shooting percentage, and that when that comes down, he's not going to get as lucky anymore. So my intro is funny, I hope. But uh, one minor thing about minor major thing about Nick Schmaltz uh, I just want to point out because I didn't give any stats I just basically ragged on him for not having ice time but the big thing here is for a second line in the NHL a decent second line is going to get probably about 10% on ice shooting ish maybe even a little lower (laughs) Nick Schmaltz oh my god Nick Schmaltz has 27% on ice shooting right now which is 27% of every shot that makes to the net with Nick Schmaltz on the ice is going in. (laughs) In the past week. Yeah, in the past week. But that, I mean, for the entire, uh, so that's the six points in his last three games. So there is that. But over his entire um, season so far, that's, it's at 17%, which is still super high. But the the big thing that's happening, the reason he's being added is this last week, the six points in three games. He's only got two points in the other four games he's played. So that makes a little bit more sense. But 27% is one of the craziest numbers I've ever seen. I don't think I've seen it above 20% for, well, maybe in a week, perhaps. But for it to be that high is catastrophically over-indexed. So he's going to come down hard unless he gets significantly more ice time. I'm talking several minutes. I'm talking 30% more ice time. And he did see 16 minutes in his last game. But enough about Nick Schmaltz. The thing is, the the thing that I don't like about Nick Schmaltz, uh, I just said enough about him, but one more thing, is that, I feel like a lot he's being advertised by a lot of analysts as somebody to actually pick up without any reasoning besides the fact he's scoring points. I, I am very, very against this. All the stats show that he is going to fall off a cliff very soon. Yeah, Nick Schmaltz is like the paper child for or the poster child. The it's paper, poster, paper child. child. The paper child. This is Les Mis, actually. We went back to when it never, never mind. Yeah, did you just the poster stop right child. Now? <laughs> he is the poster child for like an unsustainable player that everyone is picking up because they see points and say, oh, I want to touch that nice thing. And they pick him up. 
He is literally the poster child for that. It's insane. Low minutes, low power play time during this last stretch where he got six points in three games. His ice time on the power play actually went down. His percentage of the team's power play time went down. His IPP is insane at 89% compared to last year's 60%. It's This is not going to continue. Now, if you want to stream him, fine. The problem is we're seeing tons of people talk about him as though he's this ridiculous long-term ad that is going to change your whole season around. And so there, I got it all, all out of my system. I wouldn't even stream him. There's so many wow, better options okay. to stream. I agree with that. I, I do. I, I think, like, for example, I like uh, Silverberg way more than than Schmaltz. I like Obviously. most of the NHL, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But there's, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not, yeah. I, I'm going to go to my next one before we all go insane. And that's Corey Perry, 10% right wing. I'm, I couldn't believe he was at 10%. I thought I was just going to be throwing shade at a guy that was 1% owned or something, but he certainly jumped up after a three-point game um, where none of anything makes sense. <laughs> Although he is playing top right wing right now, which is interesting. I don't think that's going to keep up. He's not shooting the puck. He's at a you know, scoring on one of every three shots that he takes. Um, he's he's just, yeah, everything he's doing is unsustainable as it should be fairly obvious, I feel like, with 14 minutes of ice time. Um, he's not going to be top power play. If he gets a ton more ice time, maybe you could see him be a streamer option. But at, at this point, don't drop anybody for him unless you're in, like, the world's deepest league and you need some sort of crazy upshot, upshot attempt. But he's... He's not going anywhere. He's yeah. at a 62 shot pace and Perry used to be a shooter. That was his thing. So the fact that he's not doing that means he's not even in his element. So the fact that he's getting points at all is surprising to me. And I don't think it's going to keep up at all. My next one here is going to be a goaltender in Tuka Rask. I don't really have much to say about him. I think that Boston is playing well in front of him. Uh, and so his save percentage should be solid and he should get a lot of wins this season. But the, the thing that is most concerning to me at the moment is that his expected save percentage is around 91.65% and he's currently posting a 94.62% and that's at all strengths, even on the penalty kill. Um, and that just doesn't happen. And in, in the past few years, uh, Tuka Rask has been pretty good about finishing the season around his expected save percentage. So I'd expect this all to come down. And at some point, he, I think he's due for quite a correction. And so I think that's twofold. I think it's one, uh, he is good. Don't sell necessarily, but just get ready for a moment where he He's not going to be as good as he's been. And don't overreact to that and just know that he is fine and over index the moment. I don't I don't really want to throw shade, but he's not the second best goalie for fantasy. I, I know no. there was there is a list out there that shows him as the second best goalie for fantasy. That is that is terrible um advice. First of all, you nobody that's gonna play half the games is gonna be the second best goalie, just from a volume standpoint. Yep. But also like you mentioned, he's super over-indexed. Boston, as good as they are, are actually playing worse in front of him than they were last season. So, yeah, uh, and, and they are still playing very well in front of him. I'm, I'm not saying they're not, but they were ridiculous last season, and we still saw a slightly above-average Rask, which is basically what he is at this point in his career. He's a slightly above-average goalie with a good team in front of him. What he's playing right now, his pace right now, is better than any goalie in history. So, um, as far as a goal goals saved above-average pace, it's completely unsustainable we haven't even seen anything half as good as this in years so he's he's due for a serious correction um yeah yeah um i'm gonna go into a goalie as well carter hutton uh 78 owned that's way higher than i expected i get that he's getting good amount of starts in buffalo and buffalo has been amazing but uh hutton is no spring chicken he's like 34 or something he's well beyond what uh you'd expect to be his the prime of his career i don't think he's a uh he's never really been a a trustworthy starter for the entire season so as well as he's playing right now 70 percent owned seems super high to me considering how sh how many shallow leagues there are he's he might be fun for now but it's gonna come down his career save percentage is 914 and he's parked at like a 940 something right now so uh, I, I, Buffalo has been fun, but this, and, and I do like their defense. I legitimately do like their defense, but this doesn't make sense. And uh, he's, he's going to come down back to normal. And so will Buffalo. They're going to lose some games. <laughs> it's just, that's just the future. And when they do lose some games, you couple that with the fact that Hutton is not going to be a 55 plus games played guy, most likely. Um, you wind up with, you know, a kind of lower end second goalie, 
third goalie prospect guy more than what he seems to be doing at the moment. Okay, now that we're done with that, let's move on to unsustainably low. So the guys that we think will do better uh, going forward. And my first one here is Eric Carlson. Now he's doing fine in the last week actually did fine, but I'm seeing a lot of trades uh, people putting out their trades that are bad. They're selling him low. And for whatever reason, it's one of those things where if you remember one of the past episodes, we talked about how, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, well, this guy has four points in six games. Sh should I sell him? He's not doing good. And we're like, what What more do you want from him? I, I don't know what you want. And that's kind of where I'm at with Eric Carlson. It's like he's doing fine and, and there's room to get better. He has an on ice shooting percentage of only 7% um, and he has a high IPP, but given the way he plays, I could, I expect a little bit of a higher IPP than what he had last year. And so I, I don't think it's that out of the question. And he's getting great power play deployment. And for whatever reason, people seem to be freaking out a little bit over nothing. I still like him as a somewhat buy low candidate. It seems like a lot of people are still seeing him as this defender as, oh, he's getting points right now, but he's streaky and I don't want him yet. Last year, he was one of the most consistent players in the league. So in my opinion, people are freaking out a little bit too much and he still has a little bit of ceiling to go compared to where he's at. Um, and yeah, it just doesn't make sense to me. I'm I'm high on Eric Carlson the rest of the season. Uh, one downside is that his shots are a little bit down, but aside from that, everything else looks fine. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Um, I'm actually I feel like I'm targeting Car. I I always feel like I'm targeting Carlson most most season, but again this season I feel like I'm trying to get Carlson on my team before he starts doing Carlson stuff. Um, all right, my first one I think is going to be kind of contentious actually. Wayne Simmons. 31% owned, right wing, getting dropped a lot for a good reason, right? He's got one point in eight games, so not good. Uh, and that his last week, he had two games played with no points, but that's kind of not the main focus here. It's the fact that so far he hasn't been very good, and he's been trending down for a couple of years now. Uh, so it's not it's not too super, super, super surprising to see people dropping him. Um, that said... He is actually playing pretty well this season, and he's getting a lot of um, opportunities. He's sitting at a 76% offensive zone start, so they are trying to put him in positions to score goals and get points. He uh, he's, he's hitting more than he did last season, mostly due to an increased ice time. Uh, he is playing, well, actually, he didn't, not that much of an increased ice time, but I guess just his role, he's allowed to hit more. Um, he's shooting more than last season significantly. So we're starting to see him being deployed a little bit more like how he was in the Flyers back then. So it, it the things look that, that are happening look good. He's shooting more than three times a game. Uh, actually, three times on the nose for his season, but he shot a lot, two, tw 10 times in the last two games. Uh, so he's shooting a lot. He's getting... 60% of the team's power play time. So they're, you know, he, he, trying to get him in a position to score. He's taken 24 shots and not scored yet. And he's a 13% career shooter. So he should be scoring more goals. Um, although, you know, this is not the hugest sample size. Nothing is really adding up for him. His on-ice shooting is 3%. 3%. Nick Schmaltz is 26. <laughs> Whatever. So you add all this stuff together and you're looking at a Wayne Simmons who should be pacing higher. Uh, he's not going to be a guy that you're going to get 70 points from. Those days are gone. Even 60 points is probably a stretch. But I think with the numbers I'm looking at right now, make me think he should be pacing around 55 points. That's not, again, not huge numbers, but you back that up with the fact he's going to get you pretty good uh, penalty minutes if you if you track those. He's going to get you pretty good hits, and it looks like he's going to get you pretty good shots. And if they're going to keep him on that top power play... Sooner or later, you think he'll get you decent power play points. Maybe not a ton, but, you know, high teens, that's good enough for a guy that is primarily a peripheral player. So th I'm not saying that 31% seems high or low. I actually think that's kind of in line. But um, and considering that that uh, the Devils play one game this week, I get that people are going to drop him. But don't forget about him. He's actually playing pretty well. And I think that once the Devils get better, a better schedule um, as far as games played per week, um, Simmons is going to be one of the first guys I look to start adding again if he's on the waiver wire and he continues this deployment. Okay, well, let's move into one of our darlings on the podcast, and that is Dylan Larkin. I hate to see him show up on unsustainably low, but, yep, got to talk about him a little bit. His honest shooting percentage right now is 14%, so people are shooting around him, but his IPP is only 50, and I'd expect that closer to 75, 80 with someone of Dylan Larkin's 
um, ability. And especially when you factor in how much he controls the ice uh, compared to everybody else in Detroit because they suck. He's also not really hitting that much and definitely not shooting as much. But I expect a lot of those things to come up in time. Uh, and I urge patience. I know I've seen quite a few things already about Dylan Larkin kind of slowing down. And I think one thing to remember is that, you know, he had a great initial stretch this season and right now he's not doing so hot, but in my opinion, he's one of those players that I just have to urge caution with and say, look, yes, these last three games were not that pretty, but there's a lot of positives as well on the horizon. I think for someone like Dylan Larkin. All right. My next one here is Ryan O'Reilly. Uh, no points in the last three. The annoying thing. Okay. No points in the last three games. Fine. He's got seven points on the season in nine games, which is good, but he's definitely fallen off a cliff over the last three or four games. Um, the annoying thing is he's not shooting, which he's never been a, a you know, a big shooter or anything, but uh, he should be shooting more than this. Last season, he, he got what? 230, something like that. 230 shots. This season, he's pacing at 109. <laughs> it's not a good number. Uh, but I, I, it just, none of this is adding up for Ryan O'Reilly. This is more of a, the stats don't necessarily point to super positive indicators other than the fact that, uh, his, his honest shooting is super low, uh, over the last, uh, few games at 5%. But it's, we know who Ryan O'Reilly is at this point. He's, he's more of a known qual uh, quantity than some of the other guys we might talk about on this show. He showed up really well with really sustainable numbers in St. Louis last season, um, I don't think the Sammy Blay might not be the best left wing and they are changing that now. He's getting Steen on the left wing, which uh, I, I don't know. But um, y you couple that all up with the fact that he's getting 85% offensive or no. Yeah, no. Oh, let me, let me scrap that part. Um, I was going to I thought I, I, I risk read his offensive zone to uh, his honest save percentage, which was way off. Um, all right. Uh, and one other concerning thing is that he is not getting the uh, lion's share of power play percentage, but I do think that's going to change uh, sooner or later. St. Louis is weird with their power play sometimes. We saw them change all over the place last season. We're seeing Tarasenko sort of being power play too. I don't know. So I'm, I'm a bit more of a wait and see approach. I'd actually be buying low on Ryan O'Reilly in a lot of leagues right now, um, as a lot of the indicators, like I mentioned, are pointing to like kind of negative for him. But um, just because we we know who he is, uh, he's one of the, he's probably the single best face-off guy in the entire league. So the odds of him kind of dropping off completely from that top power play just don't make sense to me when you know he's going to win you the puck most of the time. So I, I'm, despite everything I'm looking at here, I still am really high on Ryan O'Reilly. I still think he's you know a 70 plus point guy. Um, and he's still tracking at that. It's just this last week has been not so good for the Blues. Okay, my next one here is going to be another defenseman in Drew Doughty. His on-ice shooting percentage is only 6%, which is really low. Last year, he was around kind of the 8-ish percent range. And we talk a lot about on-ice shooting percentage, and for defensemen, it's even more important because most of their points come off of assists. And if on-ice shooting percentage is low, that means that they don't have as many opportunities to get assists because there's just not that many goals being scored. Now, the good thing for Drew Doughty is that his IPP is really high at the moment. Now, yes, that should come down, but the good news there is that he's factoring into all the goals that happen on the ice while he's on it. And so if the shooting percentage goes up, in theory, he will be factoring into a lot of those goals, those added goals from a higher shooting percentage. And so I think that as we see the Kings' on-ice shooting percentage go up, then we'll see Doughty's uh, points also get better. Now, he's already on a pretty good pace of around 51 points, so I think he can get a little bit higher. I wouldn't be surprised if Doughty sniffs 60. And the thing is that while the Kings, you know, everyone has talked about the Kings sucking, and that's true, on offense, they actually haven't been that terrible. They actually control shot share. Uh, and as far as advanced stats go, they are actually one of the top teams. Now, to be fair, last year they were also kind of a darling on, on advanced stats. They did that well, uh, but they still sucked. And so they're kind of this anomaly where they do well from an advanced stats standpoint, but they don't really get the results. Now, part of that can be save percentage, for example. Last year, quick was awful. Um, or it can just be like a low shooting percentage. You're taking quantity over quality. So that's something to watch. But nonetheless, still, the fact that last year, you know, they were terrible and they had, a, you know, Dowdy got like an 8-ish percent on a shooting percentage kind of led me to believe that it should be higher regardless. Yeah. Let me, let me tell you about a player here. Keith Yandel sucks mm. at defense. Yes, he does. He's bad at defense. He's a, he's a bad defenseman. He's, yes. he's pretty good at offense though. So 
I, I think Yandel is one of the one of the players that I've been asked about the most. We've been asked about the most. Um, there are very concerning things happening with him. Uh, the, and you realize I'm still talking about unsustainably low. So this is I'm going to scare you for a bit and then hopefully uh, walk you off the cliff. The, walk you away from the cliff. Away, not off. Anyway, anyway um, last year he played over 22 minutes a game. This year he's playing 18 minutes a game and it's going down, um, which de- that's not great. The, the flip side of this is they are like refusing to play him in his own end. <laughs> so they, they, he's starting an unbelievable 82% in the offensive zone. Um, they straight up don't want him. I, I assume if the play transitions, they just pull him. And that's why he's getting such low ice time. They do not want him in his own end. And it makes sense. If you look at his, at his uh, stats on hockey viz, it's just horrible. Um, but that is making it look like, and to an extent, this is a problem, that his ice time is super, super low because it is. But he's still getting pretty good offensive ice time because he's just strictly played in the offensive zone. And you can see that uh, because his shot pace is actually higher than it was last season. He's still shooting a lot. Um, and then it's just not going in for him anyway. Uh, his IPP is 37% on the season, so a little low. Not quite getting there on the power play, especially not like last season, although all three of his points so far are on the power play. Um He's still getting a lion's share of power play time, which you'd expect because he's a pretty good uh, offensive defenseman for power play QB stuff. Um, sitting at 67% on the power play, uh, time on ice. So there are indicators that are positive and negative for him. The biggest, most obvious negative indicator besides him, the lack of points, is the ice time. Although, unless it stays at this 15 minute, which I really don't like. If it stays at 15 minutes, that's terrible. If he can get back to that 18, 19 minutes a game and stay at 80% offensive zone starts, I'm fine with it, honestly. Um, I don't mind if he's if he's losing four minutes a game because those four minutes a game would have been the time he's playing in, in the defensive end anyway, where he doesn't block shots, he doesn't do anything in the defensive end other than get scored on and give you, you know, negative if you take plus minus for some reason. So I hate the ice time, but I as long as it doesn't stay down at like 15 minutes. I'm not overly concerned, despite how scary it sounds. Uh, again, assuming that his offensive zone start stays high. Um, and that's it. There, Yeah, Yandel's weird. Really weird this season, but I'm not overly concerned. Yeah, they're, they're doing that, actually, I think, across the league, sort of. You see that with Gustafson. You see that with Ghost. You see these guys who are really good offensive players getting more and more third-line deployment, third-pairing deployment, but top power play. And so they're makes trying sense. to utilize their offensive skills. It does. I mean, it makes sense I'm from a it's not like control shot share. I'm surprised it's not the thing you do because how many yeah. offensive defensemen are actually good defensively? Look at Brent Burns. Like, why? I don't know. <laughs> it's like This could be a whole other topic about how do you actually develop an offensive defenseman? And do you play him like a pitcher in baseball where you, you know, he's going to, he's going to get out when he gets the bat, if he has to bat, but he has a role and it's, that's why you play him. So I don't know. Yeah. Didn't mean mean to make a baseball reference there, but there you have it. All right. I've got one. It's it's appropriate for the playoffs. Yeah, (laughs) true. We've got one, or I've got one more left front standing below and that is Timo Meyer. Um, I'll be a little quicker with him. He's only got one point in his last two games, which whatever, uh, three points in eight games to start the season. Biggest concerns are the lack of power play ice time, which uh, I'm not super surprised. It was, he didn't get a ton of power play ice time last season either. That was an upside thing. If he got, if he got top power play, that was good, but it wasn't expected. So, and I still think it's possible. You know, you could see, you could see Kane or LeBanc both shift out of top power play. And the guy that's going to step into that role, if it's not Eric Carlson, or Burns, or whoever's not on top power play at this point, would be Meyer. So let's ignore that for now and realize he's still shooting pretty good, you know, around three a game, which is what you expect from him. His hits are basically on pace. Everything he's doing is similar to last season. It's just no shot, no goals. 5% on ice shooting for the season for him so far, way too low. Uh, That's the biggest thing. Everything else feels more or less in line. Um, So his points are going to come back up. You know, he's He's not going to be a point per game player or anything, but there's a lot of panic. There's people dropping Meyer left and right. Did I, I am very hard pressed to drop a guy that I expect will shoot three times a game for the entire season and get you hits. Um, and then couple that with the fact that he's going to get points. He will, he's going to get points. Uh, he should pace pretty similar to, to what he did last season with about 65. So 
Um, I think people are freaking out a little bit too much on Meyer. Um, the only concern is something that was a concern last season in his power play uh, ice time. And yeah, the Sharks are kind of weird right now, but I'm not, I'm not concerned. Yeah, I'm not concerned about T.O. Meyer. I'm holding. And on top of that, like, you know, you have the left wing, right wing, and the ceiling is there. And I think as a whole, when you look at the Sharks, like you were saying, they're all kind of underperforming at the moment. Everyone everyone is low. They're still figuring it out for whatever reason. Um, whether that has to actually do with Pavelski or not is is TBD. But, you know, even with T.O. Meyer, you know, that on ice shooting percentage is so, so low. Compared to last year, he was 11%. And this year, he's at 5 So there's a lot of good things still i think with timo meyer and his ipp is actually the same as it was last year the only big difference is that on ice shooting percentage so if that on ice shooting percentage comes up in theory his points will as well so you just need the sharks around him to do better Okay, moving into Sustainably High, which are the guys that will keep doing the things that they're doing. And my first one is going to be Jeff Petrie, who I really didn't expect to show up on this list. I remember when we were doing our team previews, Jeff Petrie was one of the guys that I said, you know, he had a good season, but it was largely only because Weber was out. And to be honest, that was a case. Because as soon as Weber came back, he wasn't that great. But when you look at it this season, his ice time is up from last year, which is impressive as hell considering last year you know most of it was because Weber was out his shooting percentage is actually lower than last year he's one of the highest expected goals for players in the league which is insane because huh. he's a defenseman and it's Jeff Petrie his uh, honest shooting percentage isn't that insane so his points are sustainable his IPP is actually lower than last year his power play percentage the time he plays on the power plays higher than last year his shooting is way way up to be honest, I'm in on the Petrie train right now and very low on the Weber train. The Weber train is leaving the station as far as I'm concerned at the moment. Uh, it seems like the person that they're playing that offensive role is Petrie and not Weber. And quite frankly, when you look at all the stats, Petrie's deserved it so far. I'm nothing against it. He has deserved it. It's not like he's being lucky. It really does seem like he is fully deserving what he's getting at the moment. And he's playing fantastically well. I don't think he's a buy target. Uh, I think he's a pickup if he's available in your league sort of guy to pay attention to just because his offensive numbers have been ridiculous and, like I said, sustainable. Uh, but that being said, I don't think he's like a go and immediately grab. And as far as Weber goes, I wouldn't drop him, but I'd maybe shop him and just see what people will give you. Because uh, if this continues, it doesn't look great for Weber. But I'm high on Petrie, so there's that. Yeah, I mean, Weber is still, he still fits his little niche of hits and blocks and whatever but yeah beyond if you that draft him for points i mean he's still, uh, he's still got I mean, five and nine he's not doing horrible that's pretty he's good not for doing horrible but yeah i mean he's not he's not shea weber of five years ago but um all right my first one is a guy that we've been talking about for a while and i do think he's an immediate pickup due to scheduling and that's vladislav nemesnikov the trade to ottawa is the best probably the best thing that could have happened to him um, and the reason is, I mean, fairly obvious, I think, right? Ottawa has nobody. They don't have players. Uh, Nemesnikov is not, he's not great, but he's, he's decent. And decent is better than almost everybody in Ottawa. <laughs> so you, when you take a decent player and you put him in a terrible system, you need to give him a ton of minutes. And that's where he's seeing. He saw a huge, huge, huge increase in ice time when he jumped over to, to Ottawa from the Rangers. You know, he was playing, what, like 15 minutes a game on the Rangers? He played a little over 15 minutes a game uh, for the, for last season. Now he's playing 19 to 20 minutes per game in Ottawa. That's a, that's just enough right there for a guy that gives you shots and hits. He's pacing, you know, a little under three shots a game, which is still fine for a guy that is essentially a streamer candidate for the most part. But his hits are there, too. He's usually a little bit above a hit per game guy, and that's what we're seeing. That's actually, actually a little bit higher than that on uh, on in since he's joined Ottawa um, he's sh yeah so he's shooting more he's hitting more and that all factors in with how he's being used over there so he's he's not he may not be like an offensive a huge offensive guy but I think his his point pace should be pretty decent considering it might be one of the best actually it must be right one of the best on Ottawa because who else has a good point pace Brady Kachuk and Chabot that's it so Nemesikov is probably the third best guy there which is crazy um that's sad. Actually, he is. There's, there's no, there's who else? It's got to be. He's got to be the third best player uh, for fantasy. Um, so yeah, uh, all of his numbers look pretty decent. His shooting is high, right, twenty two percent. But um, you expect some of that to turn into assists. Um, 
I I like him. I, I really like him for for uh, weeks when you can play him. He's not he's not a pick up and hold forever guy. But um, when when Ottawa has these weeks like like they do this week where they're playing a lot of weak teams and they're playing off nights, um, why not? Why not play a guy that's playing twenty plus minutes a game and is giving you peripherals even if he's not scoring and he's also scoring. So uh, I, I do like him um, when the situation dictates it. Hmm. I like that take, although I don't know if I necessarily, I, I think I think it's important to stress, like you said, that he is a streaming option and someone who will forever, I think, be a very solid streaming option. But I don't see Nemesnikov being a long-term keep on your team sustainably high guy. I think in, in, if you're in a 14-team league, I can see it, actually. Yeah, okay. In a 14-team or, or anything deeper than that, then potentially I could see it, especially depending on the rosters. He's also left wing, right wing, and he's only 9% yeah. owned. Which is kind of like, I, I guess I, I get it because he hasn't been on Ottawa that long. But ever since he joined Ottawa, he should be higher than 9% considering what he's been doing. Um, I picked him up it's in also like just three or four leagues this week. I don't know how many I'm going to keep him after this week is over. But I think, yeah, I think the thing I, I don't know is I don't know if he has enough. I don't know if there's enough consistency there in terms of lines. Like it feels like Ottawa just throws their lines to the line blender every other game. Yeah. And you never know what you're going to get out of it aside from Kachuk and Shabbat. And that's the thing that I fear the most with Nemestikov is I don't feel like his deployment is a surefire thing or anything close to safe. Yeah, you you basically have to bet on him himself, which is the opposite of what happened in Tampa, right? When he blew up in Tampa, yes. it was because he was playing with Stamkos Kucherov. And, and he somehow, I don't know how every player that gets that deployment hasn't made it work, but he made it work. Um, and then he moved to the Rangers and then whatever. But the thing is they need, they need him. He's more of a, like a, that guy crazy as it, as it sounds, uh, in Ottawa, he has to be relied on because they just don't have any other option. Um, that was sort of Nemesnikov last year when he got traded to the Rangers. They were kind of hoping for the same thing. Yeah, but they only played him, you do know, it. less than 16 minutes a game. It's not like they, the second he got to Ottawa, they were playing him 20 plus. They just went, sure. they just went for it. <laughs> so, and he did spend a little bit of time on that top line. But again, what even is a top line in Ottawa? It, it's like, there. the best case scenario is you play with Brady Kachuk. And that's not the best, honestly. Kachuk's fine, but he's not like amazingly offensive or anything. Yeah, names is weird. Ottawa sucks. The next guy here I have is someone Brandon really likes. He loves this player, and that's Brock Nelson. He loves Brock Nelson Man, I, so much. I hate Brock Nelson. I don't like looking at him. <laughs> like I've just seen him be such a bad player for so long as an Islander fan, but whatever. Yeah, but I think right now what he's doing is is good, and it's sustainable. His shooting is up around 40% at the moment. You know who he reminds year. me of? Who? Vladislav Nemestikov. Oh, my God. Seriously, they're playing pretty much the same You're game. Not yeah, you're not wrong. You're not terribly wrong there. Just left wing, right wing versus point center left wing. Pace. Yeah, I, I think names at sixty two. But Brock Nelson, I think if you temper your expectations to around a sixty point pace, I think you do okay, 55. especially in deeper leagues. I'll give you fifty five. Uh, sure, fine. not 55 one more. To sixty somewhere in there. If he continues to shoot like this, I could see that continuing. But that's the big thing I want to watch is I want to watch the shooting. But he, the the one thing that I would watch is his on ice shooting percentage. It is at twenty one percent over the last week, fourteen on the season. So that will normalize. So that's one thing to pay attention to. Uh, but with this shooting being up, I, I like that you get the shot peripherals, and on top of that, you do have a little bit of point upside. So I think in a deeper league, he's kind of worth it. But uh, yeah, again, the shots are the thing you have to watch for. I think yeah, he's. I think he could follow the exact same kind of guidelines as Nemestikov here. He's a good streaming yep. option. Don't necessarily expect to hold him long-term. I'm going to stick with another Islander, actually, in Matthew Barzell. Um, now, we saw him fall off a cliff last season, right? Everybody thought, point break, including me, including us, thought point per game-ish pace uh, with bad peripherals. Uh, what he did was get you 62 points in 82 games, which sucks with bad peripherals. 62 points in 82 games is a fine pace if you're doing other things. Um, but you're not so bad. But what we're seeing so far is he's shooting more this season. He's shooting a good amount more. He's pacing for over 200, which will be the first time he's ever done that uh, in his short career. But um, he, his play seems a bit better too. And I think that might have to do with uh, the supporting cast and the Islanders in general finally finding a way to play with him <laughs> because he just kind of does everything himself and guys are just trying to find lanes, essentially. Um, and that style is finally starting to work and he's not falling down as much, which helps. Um, so the the thing that I like about Barzell is you were able to get him late. 
He reminds me of kind of Kopitar. They're basically very similar to me uh, this season. Able to get them very late. Uh, neither one shoots a ton, but the fact that Barzell's shooting more than ever is very encouraging to me. And um, he's such a highly skilled player that his ceiling is like very, very high. It's just his floor is, you know, what we know. His floor is 60 points with no peripherals. But his ceiling could be above point per game with okay peripherals. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I would call him above point per game yet, but I really do like his pace right now. And I think everything he's doing is fairly sustainable. His shooting percentage is a little high and his IPP is crazy. But uh, his on ice is, you know, just under 10%. He's actually playing a little bit less power play time than I'd expect so far, and I think that will change. I think he'll they'll probably fifty fifty it, but I think I really like the what uh, what Barzell's doing, and I actually wouldn't I would like to target him in, in some of my leagues if I can if people are willing to sell low. Still, they probably would. I, I bet most people view Barzell as this guy who's just a hot shot right now, and they've lost faith. I mean, look at where he went in the draft this year, right? People mm-hmm. have lost a lot of faith in Barzell, so I I feel like it wouldn't necessarily be like a it's weird because you wouldn't necessarily be buying low, like you said, but yeah. people would be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm they still don't high. buy it. Yeah, they don't buy that it's real. Right. And my last one here is going to be from Vegas in Riley Smith. Honestly, he's performing just about as well as he was last year, just with way, 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 way more shots. Shooting percentage is really high, but that's all right for now as it'll come down. I think he's going to get more assists. Uh, I think right now he's a really, really good streamer option while he's hot, and I could see him being hot for a few more weeks, especially given his ice time, which is up to around 18 to 19 minutes a game right now. Uh, I like his deployment. I like his line mates. And so I think for right now, at least, I, I like what he's doing especially the shots. The shots are the biggest thing that are that are impressing me quite a bit compared to last year. For the most part, you can take a look at how he was last year from a points perspective, and if that was worth it to you, and then add a few shots on there, then he's going to be worth it in your league. Yeah, uh, I've got one more Islander. I don't know why. What? I, yeah, I do. So many, I have an Islander in another section. So and many you, uh, One other. What, what other section could you mean? No, um, all right. So my, my last Islander is Semyon Verlamov. Goalie, oh, yeah. 69%. Um, there was a massive, massive overreaction to his bad game. Uh, his one bad game. The guy's got, he's only played four games. He's got three quality starts. He had one bad game. But everything that he's doing, as opposed like, okay, he's got a bunch of good games, right? And then you compare him to a guy like Rask or something. And it, it, you could see that that's the, the bad game has to happen once in a while. And I'm not saying that Varlamov is as good as Rask, but the fact of the matter is the Islanders play a certain system and it's been working. It's not, again, we, neither one of us think it's going to be as good as it was last season where both goalies put up 930s or whatever, but I could see both goalies putting up 920s. And that's what Varlamov is sitting at right now, a 923. A a 923 and a 2.54 goal against average. That feels mm, slightly high on the save percentage, but I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised to see him end with that. And for as cheap as you were able to get him, he's that's pretty good value. I, he's actually a free agent in some leagues that I'm in, which I like. <laughs> I get that he's not a volume starter, but as a second goalie to compliment somebody that to make sure you hit your minimums, I'm I'm surprised that he's available. Uh, same deal with Grice. Like they're they're essentially one you know one or the other. It doesn't really matter to me uh, yeah. because it's a system game, um, and the system's working, and they're both good enough to play in in said system and that's all that matters to me um grice has already proved it over a season for Lamov looks fine so uh i was just surprised to see the huge varlamov hate after one game of bad play against the jets who are super good offensively Okay, and as always, we end the show with bums. So let's move on to the bums. And the first one is someone who was the hottest bum of the week a few weeks ago, and that was Sammy Blay. Everyone was picking him up, and now everyone is dropping him. Um, I remember when we talked about Sammy Blay, we had pretty much said, look, right now he's fine, but he's a Blay Coleman. You pick him up for peripherals first and foremost, and then points upside. That's pretty much it. And and that being said, he hasn't even been hitting as much as he was before. Like on the season, he's on like a 300-ish point pace. Uh, sorry, 300. 300 is hit pace and now he's on more of like a two last week he's been on a 200 ish hit pace so that's coming down at the moment uh so that's of course something to watch but that's a lot of that has to do with just ice time coming down as ice time comes down he doesn't have as many opportunities for hits unless you're ryan reeves william carrier in which case ice time does not matter for you you bang people literally all the time 
I okay. I should have said that differently, but okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh well, that is staying in the show. So Sammy Blade to me is somebody who look was a good streamer option. He had his time. Congratulations. But now it's time to move on. Uh, I think that some of the some of the takes on him before were a little bit ridiculous, saying that he could be this next big thing. Um, he is. He was the Nick Schmaltz of a week ago. So there you go. Time to move on. Another guy, th this this player that I mentioned, by the way, is 64% owned right now. Um, and that's Justin Falk. Same team, St. Louis. Falk has lost everything that made him valuable, basically. Yeah. Um, if you drafted him, you shouldn't have been drafting him for points because even if he stayed in Carolina, he never really got them. But the problem here is that his shot pace is down, his hit pace is down, his blocks pace is down. Everything is down. His points are right in line, but honestly, I think they're going to drop too because he's not getting uh, majority power play time like he used to. Um, nothing looks good. Uh, nothing looks good. <laughs> yeah, it's it's time to give up on Falk. Like, like, like you said, I think that the thing is that before he had a pretty decent floor, and that was the reason worth keeping him yeah. was, okay, his peripherals. Maybe you knew, you'll get you, knew you get 200 shots, you'd get 100 and something hits, and you get 100 and something blocks. And now you're getting 180 shots, maybe? And then yeah. like less than 100 of the other two, it's not good. Another guy that used to have a pretty solid floor, but is looking like he may be irrelevant this season is Chris Kreider. And quite frankly, honestly, everything outside of probably Zibanejad and Panarin look bad for the Rangers at the moment. Um, Truba. And, and, and Truba, right. But aside from that, really, Chris Kreider has been awful. He has super, super low even strength time on ice. Uh, that went up a little bit in the most recent game because he was moved to the top line. Uh, before that, he was, I think, the third lowest player at five on five. Uh, from a time on ice perspective, which is not good. His shots are way down. Uh, the IPP is the same. It, healthy on ice shooting percentage, good power play time on ice. Hits are down. Just the problem is the Rangers suck. And there's just not as many points to get in on. And on top of that, the Rangers don't really control shot share. They don't really control possession. And so there's not as many opportunities to actually take shots. And so guys like Kreider struggle in systems like that. He needs to be offensive to matter. Um, and quite frankly, right now, the Rangers just don't have the team around him to make him relevant anymore. I think he still might get 50 points. But now you're looking at barely any peripherals from him. Uh, and not barely, but I should just say you know, way less than before and making him way less relevant. And right now there's line blend going on we don't know what the hell's going to happen uh, in new york anytime soon brandon smith is playing third line w what are they doing um and so i i just can't really seem to put any faith in any ranger at the moment that is not named truba panarin or sabanajad yeah i totally agree um this next player i think has made it here again and i think people might be getting annoyed at this point but considering his ownership percentage is still 94 percent and I'm not saying drop him, but ship him. Please trade him. Do something. Tyson Berry. Um, four points in 10 games, but they happened all at the beginning, essentially. He's done nothing in his last four. Like, nothing. Um, his shot pace is still fine. He's going to get you around 200 shots. But uh, he's not much beyond that. Like, he's never a big peripheral guy. He's pacing 90 blocks. He's pacing 33 hits, which is pretty much in line with his career. And the bigger problems are the, the most obvious thing is his power play. And we've talked about this so often. Um, he is getting about 40% or less of the team's power play production, uh, uh, time on ice. Last season, he had 92%, which is about the highest number I think I've seen, ever seen. Um, he just played the power play, and that's what he did. And now that's not the case. And a bigger, like, not a bigger thing, but another big thing is he used to play 72% offensive zone time, or, or offensive zone starts, meaning he always... If there's a face-off, he was basically there uh, in the offensive zone. This season, he's at about 55%. That's a pretty steep drop. That means he's being played more um, generally, just in any situation. And that's bad for offensive production, especially if you don't block. So you're not really going to get many blocks out of him either. You're just losing him his ability to make uh, to score goals or to get uh, you know to be on the ice for goals. His uh, his on ice shooting percentage is a little lower than than last season, so that might come up a bit. He may get a little bit more points going forward but uh the i mean the big obvious thing is the power play time on ice especially when you factor in that toronto i, I don't like to make this claim for a lot of teams but toronto's historically shown it they don't get a lot of calls um and that's starting to happen again they're starting to once again not get a lot of calls they got a ton at the beginning of the season not really happening again 
If that keeps up, then you're looking at a guy who used to play a ton of power play ice time on a team that got a ton of power play opportunities to playing not a lot of ice time on a team that doesn't get a lot of opportunities. That's a double whammy. That's going to be really hard to recover from. So uh, these these projections of a 60-point season from Barry, we already said they were overblown when we came into the season. Y yeah, uh, expect a guy that gets you all right shots, terrible other peripherals, and like maybe 45 points. Um and not a lot of power play points. It's 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 a bad look. Yeah, I mean, right now his points are cut in half from last season, and that feels right. I mean, that, that's what you should expect, right? His situation got pretty much cut in half from last season. Yep. Sure, you may have a better five-on-five -five team, but your power play points, where was his bread and butter, is, is gone down. And I don't see any place, and we talked about this in the offseason so much. I th We thought it was absolutely ridiculous that Tyson Berry was being drafted as high as he was, that he was being even projected as high as he was. And I thought, yeah, he was like a you know 40-point defenseman at best. Um, I don't, I'd give him 45. I, I, just, I think he's got it, but we'll see. Uh, sure, I guess. 45 I is mean, like, we'll that, that's basically the ceiling of a not power play one defenseman to me. And that's like, as mm. it's hard, it's really, really hard to pass 45 points without power play one. I don't know. If I were you, I'd look for the Toronto fan in your pool yes. and try to get something for yes. him. Because in my opinion, I think people are going to come to the realization on what Tyson Berry really is real soon here. I think right now you try to shop Berry. And we're not saying... Don't drop We him. should clarify. Don't just like throw him away for picks or like i mean for for nothing like don't don't just literally give him away what we're saying is shop him around see what you can get uh more likely than not right now i think you put him in front of somebody and that person is going to say oh tyson barry is going to turn it around that's tyson barry i can't believe they're offering yeah, me or to him whereas if you wait two, two right? weeks yeah or two if you two. wait in two weeks you're going to hear more of a mm, i don't know i'm going to wait for barry to turn it around whereas right now people are probably saying oh he's going to turn it around yeah um I would swing him for Klingberg as fast as possible if you can. And I feel like he was drafted above Klingberg in most leagues. And Klingberg is struggling yep. right now. So he seems like a decent target. Ridiculous. Yep. Uh, my last one here is going to be Anders Lee on the New York Islanders. It, things don't look good. As a Lee owner, I'm giving him like a week more here. Uh, the reason for that is he's a goal scorer. So I'm willing to wait out on goal scorers. Uh, they are rare and harder to find. But the problem is that his shot pace is way down. Uh, which means less goals. His shooting percentage is actually higher than last year at the moment, but he's shooting so much less that it's nearly impossible for him to ever hit that goal total that he did last year if he continues like this, simply because he's not shooting as much. Uh, the on-ice shooting percentage isn't terrible at 8%. He got 10.5 last year, which may have been a little bit high. And on top of that, the Isles aren't getting many power play calls. Uh, they haven't been on the power play very much. He's playing 42% of, or 43% of his team's power play time but he got less than a minute of power play time on ice all season on average. So, Wait. yeah, the Isles in general just aren't getting many power plays, and that's also going to hurt him. But, I mean, last year he only played around three minutes on average per game of, of power play time, and that's not fantastic. Not terrible. Um, so, not terrible, but not incredible either, For given that that was 60% of their time on ice. Yeah. Um, that's Justin Falk numbers, actually, weirdly enough. I still have his sheet up, so he played also three minutes of average time on ice last season, power play. Yeah, I... Look, Andrews Lee, I think I'd give him maybe a week more. See what happens this week with the Islanders. And then after that, I think you're you're safe to cut bait. Like I, I don't I don't want to hold on too much longer. Uh, I want to see if his shooting goes up this week. It, it was up last week from a you know, his season is a 133 pace. Uh, this last week was a 164 pace. That's still not good enough for me. Last year he shot at 204, and the only lever he can pull to get back to his goal scoring from last year is shooting more. Uh, so I want to see that come up, but quite frankly, I don't know if that's going to happen. So if I don't see good shots this week, I'm I'm dumping. The thing with Lee is he's he's one of the better tip guys in the game. Um, like him and Pavelski are probably like right around the top. Um, but if the Islanders can't sustain pressure in the offensive zone, he can't really do anything. Like get in position and tip. So causes problems. And of course, if you're not if they're not getting power play opportunity, that's the best tan that's the best time for him to be able to stand in net front presence and do his thing. But gonna hurt all right i've got two more one probably not so contentious one probably pretty contentious so <laughs> my next one is mikhail granland at uh he's left wing right wing he's still 50 57 percent owned which i thought was kind of high um i've talked about it a couple times the biggest problem is no power play opportunities um or rather you know he's not getting he's not getting top power play uh and he probably is never going to at this point 
uh, unless there's significant injuries. He's getting about 38% of the team's power play time, which is still actually averaging out to decent actual time on ice, but it's on a worse line. So none of it really matters. He's got no points in his last three games. His time on ice is going down. Um, he's just not relied on in the same way he was in Minnesota. He was good in Minnesota because Minnesota needed him. And Nashville, kind of, they have they have good enough wings that they don't need to rely on a guy like Mikhail Granlund. Uh, more of a jack-of-all-trades player than a goal scorer or an assist guy. So it, you, you realize with, with Granlund, you're also getting no peripherals. Um, and I don't know. His point pace is going to be low enough that he's probably a streamer option in a lot of leagues at this point. Um, he, the only good sign, I think, for him is he's, his uh, offensive zone start is pretty high, but it doesn't it hasn't mattered, and I'm not sure it's going to. So, yeah. Low on Granlund rest of the season. And then my last one here, and this is going to be interesting because I'm actually high on him short term, but I'm low on him long term. And that's uh, William Nylander. So uh, this seems like last season again, doesn't it? Um, his, his point pace is okay right now. Uh, it's not great. He's, po- he's like about 50. Mm, you know, there's room for improvement there. But the problem is I, I don't see where it comes from. If he's not going to get top power play, and th- that's, that's, that's kind of full stop. I think William Nylander needs top power play. He needs to be able to bump uh, Johans- uh, Johansson off of top power play. I don't see it happening. Um, however, with Tavares out, and if he continues to get this deployment next to Matthews, we could see a short-term uptick in production from him. And if I was a Nylander holder, which I am not in any league, unsurprisingly, I would be using this, any potential offensive burst he gets while Tavares is out to shop him as high as possible to people who want to touch nice things. <laughs> Yes, he did it. He said it. Yeah. Oh my, we have transcended space and time. I have nothing more to say. I've, I've completed my mission. I can go back to the, my uh, my aliens now. Yeah, uh, he does get offensive zone starts, but uh, I don't know, man. It just, nothing nothing here jumps out at me. Like, I, I really want to hold this below 200 shot pace guy that's going to give me no peripherals and like 55 points. I just don't see it especially if none of those points are on the power play. Now, if he can consistently stay on top power play and actually produce in something other than the bumper spot, which is where he is right now, while Tavares is out, then great. But I don't see it yet. They seem to like Johansson there. so Or Johnson there. Johansson. There's so many J names. <laughs> Johansson, Johnson, and Johansson. Johansson. God, I hate it. Anyway, Johansson. Wow. I'm so proud of you. I'm not. All I took away from that was that you said it. Yeah, I think that's it. I have nothing more to say. That's <laughs> I'm going to end it with that, I think. There you go. That is the unsustainable episode. Uh, Brandon Sane touching nice things every episode is sustainably high, by the way. And we will catch you for the weekend preview on Friday. Thanks for listening. Yep, thanks for listening.